Welcome to episode 12 of The Wealthy Neighbor Show. This week, Kyle Depius stopped by to share his financial journey, and I wanted to change the format a little bit in order to share something with you first. Kyle and his wife made a huge discovery about how they manage money early in their journey, and this discovery led them to pay off almost $380,000 in only 38 months. Now, if you do quick math, you already know that this averages out to about $10,000 a month in debt payments. And while this is an absolutely incredible accomplishment, I have a feeling that some of you out there are already thinking, well, I don't even make $300,000 in 38 months, so I can never do this. And you'd be right if you don't make that amount of money. You couldn't do it. But here's the thing. Kyle's journey is his and yours is yours. So before we start the episode, I just want to advise you not to look at Kyle's numbers and feel discouraged or less than. It may take you 38 months to pay off 38,000 worth of debt, and that's okay. Don't let the comparison game, which is usually what leads most of us into debt, be what keeps you there. And so with that said, Listen for the strategies, listen for the mindset, listen for the tips that you can apply to your life going forward, because I promise you, there are a ton of them in this episode. And if you walk away from this episode and you actually go and apply the things that Kyle is talking about, you will be much better off financially for it. That is an absolute guarantee. So kick back. Open your mind a little and enjoy this time we have with Mr. Kyle Depius. Welcome to the neighborhood. My name is Michael Lacey, husband, father, and host of the Wealthy Neighbor Show, where every week we bring you an amazing interview or message to inspire you as you build wealth for your family. Thanks for stopping by the neighborhood. Now let's jump right in with today's message. So Kyle, first things first, I want to thank you for coming on the show. I really do appreciate your time, man. I mean, it's it's an honor to have you here today. Now, when I was preparing for this interview, one thing kept popping into my mind, and that's this. You guys obviously had a really good income with how fast you were able to pay everything off. But while you were making such a good income, you also racked up $380,000 worth of debt. So what was it that made you and your wife realize that something was wrong and that you had so much debt? Uh, So first of all, I'm pumped to be here. Thanks for having me, Michael. But so what I would say is I'm I'm a numbers guy. I'm a numbers nerd. And what I like to do in between Christmas and New Year's each year is I like to look at our goals. So I look at the current year and how we did. And then I, with my wife, we we project and we forecast the next year. So for me, it was just listing all the debts, putting them all together. And again, being a numbers guy, I've created our own net worth statement. And I just like to look at it. I like to track our progress. And we were looking at it uh, one year between 15. 2015 and 16, and we added up all the debt, and it just took man, it just took our breath away. Three hundred and eighty thousand dollars, including a mortgage. But we just said, you know what, this this is too much. We got to work on this. And so for us, it was just listing out all of our debts together, just staring at the monster. Yeah, and and so prior to that, I mean, how were you guys getting along prior to that? Like, were you did you guys feel like anxious about money? Did you feel like you were struggling, or was was you know this just like, hey, this is just a normal everyday life that we have here? Yeah, it felt normal. It just felt like this is this is what this is what we do. You know, we've got a got a car loan, uh, we've got a mortgage, we've got credit cards. We're we're paying off the credit cards, but we have them, and it just felt like uh, you know we're just moving along like every other. Every other family in in America, this is just what happens. This is what we do. Yeah. So you mentioned credit cards, cars, mortgage. How did that break down for you guys? Yeah, we had. So we didn't at that point. We did not have credit card debt, but we had credit cards, uh, but no debt. We paid it off month to month, and then we had fifteen thousand in a car loan. Uh, we had a mortgage on a condo which we were renting, and that was about ninety thousand. And then the remainder, then about two hundred seventy, was in our primary mortgage. And so what were you guys making around that time? 
about 175. So my wife was in her job as a recruiter. And then I was a high school business teacher. I was a former corporate executive, completely burned out of that and redesigned life around more fulfillment. And for that, at that season, was a high school business teacher. So that's what we were doing. We were doing about 175 at that point. Okay. And so you guys are making 175 and then you have this awakening where you realize you're $380,000 in debt, which is like double your annual salary, right? (laughs) How did you feel in that moment when you totaled everything up? Overwhelming. Uh, Looking at that number, seeing what we were making, it just, I mean, it takes your breath away. So for anyone who's listening to this, I'd, I'd encourage, maybe your numbers aren't the same, but I encourage people to look at their ratios. So like you had said, our debt was about two times our annual income. So I encourage people not to compare number to number in terms of income and debt, but look at your ratios. And yeah, man, just completely overwhelming. So I was actually teaching high school business at the time and I was teaching personal finance. And um, everything that I was teaching those students was leading us to be in the spot that we were at, which was overwhelming. And I just, from an integrity standpoint, I couldn't teach that anymore. So I went out and I wrote an essay to get a grant to bring Dave Ramsey's curriculum into the high school. And we did that. And I started teaching that to our students. And that's about the same time that we started on Dave Ramsey's plan too. So you guys start on the plan. Let, well, let me back up a little bit. So yeah. you sit down, you map everything out and you're obviously married at that time. So how did your wife feel? I mean, was she initially on board with this plan to get out of debt or was she kind of resisting a little bit? Mm-hmm. I mean, kind of how was that dynamic at first? She uh, she was on board with the fact that we needed to make a change. And here's why. Here's what I encourage everyone to do. It, most people don't know this, but you can go to socialsecurity.gov or I think it's ssa.gov. And most people go on there like, oh, I can see what my social security benefits will be when I retire. But what it also shows you is your life to date earnings. So when I was going through that, I looked at my life to date earnings and I had made at this time over a million dollars. And I was like, Kyle, where did it all go, man? I don't have anything. Our ne- our net worth number was negative, huge negative. And so I was like, hey, honey, what's your social security number? And I pulled her life to date earnings and she made about the same. And so I'm like, babe, $2 million have come through our hands and have slipped through our hands and we have nothing to show for it. I'm embarrassed. I'm angry. I'm frustrated. I'm ashamed. And so in that moment, that was an awakening for us to say, we have got to do something different. We can't keep doing this. So in that moment, both of us were on board with, we need to make a change. It took some time for me to get my wife on a Dave Ramsey's plan though. Yeah, really. Talk to me about that. <laughs> Let's talk about that. Because like, you're laughing. So there's yeah. a story there. Well, <laughs> you know, it's uh, to me, I'm a, I'm a um, you know, strengths finders. My number one strengths finders is and I'm an activator. So when I decide to do something, I want to do it like yesterday. And I get frustrated if people around me aren't on the same level. So I was immediately on board with Dave, Dave Ramsey's plan. I mean, I was teaching it to our high school kids. But my wife was more like, oh, we got to go on a budget and, you know, we got to cut back here. We got to do this. She wasn't immediately on board, but it was because I was shoving her a budget and say, babe, this is our budget. You need to get on board. So it's not like she wasn't um, on board with the Dave Ramsey plan. She wasn't on board with me leading the charge and having her just jump in. So for anyone who's, you know, in, in a in relationships and you're doing money together, you have to communicate together the why and you have to create that budget together. Not so I'm the I'm the analytical nerd. You can't just I can't just create a budget and say here you go, here's our budget. No, you need to come together and create it together and that was the mistake that I was making for months. You made that mistake you said for months. And so what was that moment, I guess, for her, if if you can speak to that, you know, what do you feel like that moment was for her where maybe the light bulb went off or, or she finally came around? Yeah, I think it was a little bit more of like speaking in her language. So my language is numbers and my language is here's our grocery budget. Let's stay to the number where for her, it was like, well, why are we even doing this? What does this allow us to do? What And, and just paint the picture for her with what babe, what if we don't have a mortgage what can we do 
What does that mean for you? What would you like to do? And that allowed her to step into the future and understand why in the short term, we got to make some sacrifices. So I was not speaking her language. And when I learned how to speak her language and discuss and come more from the why as opposed to the number, she was on board. Yeah. So so then she comes around after a couple months and, and you kind of figuring out how to, to bring this up to her and how to talk to her. And so once you guys were on that same page, what were some of those first steps that you took when you decided again that it was time to take action? Yeah, it, well, it was it was the budget. It was big for us, right? And um, uh, just staying within that budget was really important. But then number two, we created some visuals around us to help us. Most people understand the process of achieving a goal and celebrating milestones. The same thing is true within your process of paying off debt. Have a goal, make some visuals, and then celebrate your milestones along the way. And you know what? I mean, Michael, make it fun. Like yeah. this is life is supposed to be fun. And just because you're paying off debt doesn't mean you can't have fun. Just be creative about it, but then celebrate along the way. And those those are really big things for us to do. You know, and that's interesting that you said you guys created visuals and that made it fun because I haven't interviewed anybody that's talked about creating visuals. So yeah. what kind of things were you guys doing to, to tap into that? Uh, we had one of these charts on the fridge and it was in the picture of a home, a really simple home. And every time we paid off debt, we just got to color from the bottom up. And it sounds silly, right? Coloring, we're adults here. But I would look forward to that so much on every payday. It was it was just uh, it was a game, like make it a game. Uh, there was another, we had these little uh, a vase, if you will. Uh, and on one vase was all these little uh, marbles. And in that vase had all marbles that related to how much debt we had. And then the vase next to it was empty. And every time we paid off debt, we took it from the vase that was debt and put it into the vase that was non-debt. And again, it just became so addicting. And it's such a game that you're like, oh, man, it's Friday. I get to move over seven mark, you know, whatever it might be, or I get to color in a few different lines. And it just became almost obsessive for us to, to stay with it because as silly as it sounds, you want to have that progress and you need to see that progress in order to keep going. You know, I know that there's somebody out there listening to that particular part about the visual aids yeah. and they're thinking, man, I would love to create a visual and put it on my fridge, but I have friends and family that come over and I don't want to expose myself or I don't yeah. want to put myself out there in that way. How yeah. did you got, how did your friends and family react to your journey? Um, and then what kind of effect did that have on you guys? Well, we had to really um, let go of what we thought other people were thinking about us. We don't. We don't care. Uh, we were so crystal clear on why we were doing it, what we were doing and what it would allow us to do that we didn't really care what someone else thought. And it was, I mean, it was front and center, man. Like it was, it was on our fridge. The, these vases were you know, right in the, the shelves, right by our couch. In the basement, I had large tearaway sheets with all of our goals. Like, I don't, it doesn't matter to me. Um, you know, this is what we're working towards. And my wife and I are on board. It doesn't matter if someone isn't on board. And for us, actually, a lot of people were really inspired by our journey. It's interesting. People will either be inspired or they'll be repelled by it. And right. it just brought people into our circle who were really interested and curious to learn more. And then you make an impact on their life. And it just is a, a beautiful domino or waterfall that you just get to see influence and impact in other people's lives. You know, going kind of into the the mental aspect of it, I mean, because a lot of this journey, a lot of finance is mental, right? And so talk about maybe some of those money beliefs that you guys had coming into the journey that you had to get rid of in order to pay off three hundred and eighty thousand dollars in thirty eight yeah, months. Yeah. So here's a here's a here's a big one. And uh, I want people to understand this, that so at that time, you know, we were making one seventy five and we thought to ourselves, OK. If we can't handle making 175 a year, why should we be given more? And so for us, when we understood the fact that we were being asked to manage 175 and let's get that down, because why else, uh, why should we be given more to manage if we can't handle what we're currently given? So most people are like, yeah, I'll do this when I make more money. Mm. I, I don't know. I just, I don't, I don't really know if I believe that. If you can't handle what you're given now, what makes you think you can handle more when you're given more? And so for us, I think that was really important to wrap our head around. You, you know, another one is 
you know, football, right? You're, you're a Cowboys fan. I'm a Packers fan. But in football and in like in any sports, you have to play offense and defense. So defense is cutting your expenses. Offense is increasing your income. What most people don't know about our story is that I actually left my, um, my career to stay home with our son during this process because we believed in my wife's ability to generate income. She was in a job where she's paid directly in accordance to her performance. And I know my wife, she is a hard worker and I knew she would crush it. She's on a commission uh, schedule. And so I actually stepped back and to allow her to step forward. And I, I just think that that's really important that yes, you can cut expenses, but you can only cut so far. You know, you can only cut that grocery budget so far. However, get yourself in a position where you can make more income and you're, you're uh, compensated in direct relation to your effort level. And a lot of times that looks like a commission job. So those are, those are probably two of the biggest things that come to mind right away. Gotcha. Gotcha. So you guys are, are going through the journey and you make this sacrifice essentially to, to put, push pause on your career, yep. uh, to catapult your wife's career. And so at that time, I mean, you know, you're going through, you're paying everything off. She's doing great. She's crushing it. So then when you finally reach that goal of paying off the, that last debt, that 380K in that 38 months, how did you guys feel in that moment? Surreal. Uh, the last six months of paying off the mortgage, it's funny that where we had our mortgage, we, you could not send a check in that was above, sorry, you could not pay online above and beyond just the minimum. So I, I decided that my son and I would go to the bank in person and we would drop off the check. And when we did that, the last time my wife, my son and I, I mean, it, it's, it was emotional because you finally, you're marching towards this goal for 38 months and you finally hit it and you don't know what it's going to be like. You don't know what to expect. And uh, it was emotional, man. I mean, we finally broke the, the tie of debt. And, you know, I almost start to tear up just thinking about it because it's so powerful and you, and, um, it's really hard to put words around it. Um, but yeah, it, it's emotional it is essentially what I would say. So you guys were on the Dave Ramsey plan and I know part of the Dave Ramsey plan is once you pay off that debt, you jump right into the six month emergency fund. I mean, because you guys were on this journey for a little longer than three years, did you feel like, all right, let's just jump right into it. Or did you feel like you needed a breather and a little bit of space? So great question. We did follow Dave Ramsey plan with the exception that when we finished paying off um, the, the car loan and then we got rid of the condo, we said, you know what? In 18 months, if we stayed at this intensity, we could knock off the mortgage. Let's just do it. So we decided to maintain a high level of intensity in terms of how much money goes towards the mortgage. And we kind of treated it like a personal debt because we just wanted it gone. So we maintained the intensity level all the way through. Wow. <laughs> Man, that, I mean, okay. So then talk about that mentally because 38 months is a really long time it's a to long be time. focused on one goal. And so, and I'm sure there were times where one of you got frustrated or one of you just kind of were, was like, why are we doing this? Or, you know, something along those lines. So talk about the, the mental aspect of persevering through 380K in 38 months. It's exhausting. It, it truly is exhausting. And I don't think enough people talk about this. But there is what I believe such a thing as like an achievement hangover. You've got one goal that you're working towards for 38 months. You hit it. And my wife and I were like, I don't want to talk about money for months. You know what I mean? Like that was our focus. And and there was there's a bit of a hangover to that. You kind of struggle with we focus so long, so hard that we don't want to focus on it anymore. And I don't think, I mean, that's the other side of, of achieving a goal. And most people aren't, aren't sharing that, but they're, that's real. And, um, you know, for a couple of months, we kind of just, we kind of just floated for a little bit and we kind of gave ourselves the grace to go through that and the permission to feel that experience it and then, then kind of get back on schedule. But that's real, man. That's a, it is exhausting to do that for focus on one thing for that long. So let me ask you this. I mean, looking back on it, though, is is there anything you would have done differently or would you have done it the exact same? 
Oh, it's, it's such a good question. Um, we could have lightened up our intensity while paying off the mortgage for sure. And, and I, I don't regret the way we did it because now here we are and um, it's great to not have a mortgage, but we certainly could have dialed back the intensity a little bit. Yeah. And so what kind of, I mean, what kind of effect do you think that would have had? I mean, obviously, you know, maybe you didn't do it in 38 months. Maybe it was 45 or maybe it was 50, you know, something like that, which is still an incredible accomplishment. I mean, so do you feel like, you know, anything would have been different if you had slowed it down? I mean, I don't think so. I think that it it would have allowed my wife and I a little bit more, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It just would have been less stressful, I, I guess is how I would put it, Michael. It would not have been um, such a strain to get through it. And we could have experienced maybe a little bit more throughout the process. I mean, we didn't go on vacation. We really don't eat out. My wife's got gluten, dairy, corn, soy, egg sensitivities. So we don't eat a, we don't eat out a lot as it is, but we certainly didn't much through this process. So, uh, we, we, yeah, we probably could have experienced a little bit more to make the journey a little bit more enjoyable, uh, is probably what I would say would, would be the real difference there. And so, you know, you guys are are on this journey and then going through this journey, you guys have a kid on the journey, right? Yep. Yep. So how did you balance preparing for a kid financially with paying off debt at this pace? Well, we essentially kind of, uh, so our, our son Callahan or Cal was born March of 2017. Yeah, it, about a little bit over a year into the process. And so we essentially just decided to kind of pause the payment, extra payments to the mortgage and stack up some money in the event that something were to happen um, during the pregnancy or during delivery. So we did that. We fully funded our HSA to make sure that it didn't cost us anything more out of pocket. So we made sure that we hit a couple of those uh, mini goals along the way. Cal was born. Everything was fine. And so we anything that we would have saved up, any extra money, we just then tossed all that towards a mortgage as well. So yeah, we, we just kind of paused the process, stacked up a little bit of money, and then um, just just to have that, that sense of comfort, knowing that if something were to happen, we we're okay. Uh, and then when everything was great, we just threw it all at the mortgage again. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. And so I know for me, When my daughter was born, that's like in the hospital, my wife's delivering my daughter. That's when I got the idea to create Winning to Wealth to inspire other people and to track our journey to financial peace, I mean, to financial independence. And so how did becoming a father kind of reshape that for you? Like, did you find yourself thinking about, you know, your financial legacy even more or what kind of impact did becoming a father have on that for you? Totally. Yes, it, it changes your perspective as a, as a dad, as a parent. You realize that there's, there's someone else here. There's someone else to be um, providing for, someone else to be concerned for and be caring for and thinking about and legacy comes into play and it changes everything. So when I was a really young, I, I, oh boy, two, three or four, my parents were foreclosed on on the house that my dad actually built. He's a carpenter, home builder. And I don't remember it because obviously I was really young, but I just know that that had a big effect on my parents, my dad especially. And so my wife and I were saying, we don't want this for our children. We want to change this branch of, of the tree. And that's all legacy. And that gets at, I mean, that's that gets at the heart of things, right? And so, well, you can't foreclose on a home that doesn't have a mortgage. And so we right. essentially have eliminated that as a possibility. And so, yeah, things things completely change when you become a parent and you you think about the next generation and the next generation and you want to leave them a legacy. Um, and so that, it, yeah, you're right, man. It changes everything. Yeah. And, and I know for me, I mean, you know, one of the things that I find myself thinking about, I mean, at the time of recording this, my daughter's 18 months and I'm already thinking like, okay, if I'm building wealth, like I'm going to eventually leave this to her. And so now yeah. I have to think like, How do I teach her about money so that when I leave this to her, it doesn't destroy her life? And so have you thought about that? And what are some of the ways you're thinking like this is how we're going to teach our son how to handle money? Yeah, it's um, that's so because because you you don't want them to grow up and struggle and you want them to grow up um, in another in another light. But then the challenge with that is you don't want them to be entitled. And so you have to be really intentional with some boundaries, some checks and balances, 
in order for them to actually uh, receive some of that legacy, they need to prove that they know how to handle money. And yeah, well, so Cal, our son is two and a half, so we're not too much ahead of you, but we want to teach him that, you know, money comes from work. Money isn't given to you. So uh, we really can teach him that by showing showing him that. So, you know, this summer he was out there with me picking dandelions with a with a hand tool. And it's just those little ways like, uh, Cal, we'll get, we'll get like 10, 12 of these guys and, and then we'll give you some change to put into your little piggy bank. So he's starting to, he's really young, so it's hard to teach this at this age. But our goal essentially is to teach him that money comes from work. There's a direct correlation there. You aren't just given money. You're going to earn it. And the same thing will be true as he continues to, prog- to progress through life and as he looks at receiving some of the legacy we've created. So, Kyle, I know I've, I read through your blog, and I know one of the things that you talked about is the mindset thing where you said you've transitioned from asking, can I afford the monthly payment, to now asking, can I afford to pay cash for it? Why was that mindset shift important and like how did that come about? Oh, it changes everything because when you understand the difference between can I afford a monthly payment into my budget versus can I afford to just buy it in cash, it it forces you to rethink the purchase, number one, and it, it forces you to be intentional and think into the future. And okay, so we're like, okay, so we know that, you know, we need to replace our windows in the next couple of years. I know that I need a new air conditioning unit. How much does it cost? Okay, so I start to save that money now so that when it happens, I'm not surprised because then all of a sudden you need to figure out where is four to five grand going to come from for a new AC unit. I guess I'll put it on my credit card. That's how you continue to get behind. So for us, it was just asking that question and then just getting out in front of some of these things so that um, we could truly afford it. Because if you keep asking yourself, okay, well, I can buy a new uh, John Deere lawnmower. I'd love to have a riding lawnmower. Okay, well, I can fit 125 into my monthly budget in a payment. But if I keep evaluating purchases like that, before you know it, you've got no extra money to save. You've got no money for retirement. You've got no emergency fund. And you just continue to live paycheck to paycheck. So it, that mentality will change everything when people understand that. Yeah. And you know, I, I like that because it is so important to pay attention to these little things that add up over time. I know, I mean, for me personally, you know, me and my wife, we were $61,000 in debt. And that's literally how we did it is- yeah. We would go into stores and they'd be like, you know, we'd have a thousand dollars cash and they'd say, oh, well, why don't you just finance it? You can pay it off with the cash you already have, or you can pay $19 a month for this limited time period with no interest. And so we did that over and over and over again until we were about $20,000 in credit card debt. And so those little habits, they do add up over time. Um, But another question I want to ask about, you know, you and your wife is how has going through this financial journey um, because it's been so transformational, how has that affected your marriage now? Mm. Well, communication for sure, right? We are we were forced to communicate in a way that we hadn't communicated before, and we were we we forced ourselves to dream together and get on the same page. And hey, what would we like our life to look like 10, 20, 30 years down the road? What does that look like for us? And it's one of those rare, it's one of those opportunities where you get to work on a goal together. I mean, most of the time in our lives and marriages, we're each kind of working on our goals at work or, you know, whatever it might be, but this gives you an opportunity to work together. And when you go through this journey together, um, you learn so much and it brings you closer together. And then you end up saying, okay, we can do this. We did this. Now what else could we do together? So you really kind of gain this confidence as well that you can do things together and hard things. Yeah. And so, you know, now that you guys are sold out to that plan uh, and you guys are on that same page, what are you guys doing now that you're debt free to build wealth for your future and your legacy? Yeah. So our great question, Our we always had like a 10 year vision, a big 10 year goal. So for the first 38 months, we accomplished goal number one, which I thought would take us closer to five years, which is another key for, for people that are listening to here. Um, usually when you're committed and you work at it together and you stay consistent, it happens faster than you think. So um, this this was step number one. Step number two is, is to launch a business for myself and for my wife that will allow a little bit more of lifestyle freedom and then start to accumulate assets that are paying us income to replace our 
current income so that we really could choose, hey, you know, I'm in, I'm in Minneapolis. It gets cold here. So in the winter, what if we just want to go down to Florida for the month of January? We could do that. So that's that's the point that we are now marching towards is building enough assets and businesses that will pay us, um, that will replace our current income. Gotcha. Gotcha. And so wh- where does giving fit into your financial plan? It's big. I mean, it's the first thing that happens. Um, we give 10% of our income to our local church. And then on top of that, any any things that arise, um, we, we look at, evaluate, and we also give to those uh, things as well. I just it, just yesterday, something came up on Facebook. A friend of mine's doing um, cancer awareness. And so I we donate to that as it comes up. So it's the first thing that happens. I think a lot of people look at it inverted. So they pay all their bills. And then what's left over, they might give 50 bucks here, 50, whatever it might be. It's the first thing that we do before we do anything else. And I think when that changes too, um, it changes everything for you. So it's the first thing that we do. Kyle, you have been just a a fountain of knowledge throughout this interview. (laughs) And I know people don't just show up that way, right? And so you've had things that you've learned from. And so what are some of the books or courses or or tools that you've utilized or learned, maybe learned from on this journey uh, that you can share with some of the listeners that they can dig into? Sure. Um, from a book standpoint, I like a few authors and I kind of f- focus in on the personal development, personal growth, and then like business because that's my world. Uh, I love the authors. Uh, John Maxwell, I think he's fantastic in the leadership space. Um, anything by Patrick Lincioni, he's an awesome author, fantastic. And he writes in a format that's so easy to go through and understand. So anything from those two guys I consume listen to a lot of podcasts. I walk the dog in the morning and I, a podcasts are always on when I work out podcasts are on. So I, I kind of, um, I just focus a lot of time on podcasts and books and learning and growing and learning from others. I myself invest in, in mastermind groups to learn from other people, learn from experts. Uh, we, my wife and I both have done coaching in the past, one-on-one coaching. So we really invest in ourselves. So I think that's really important. But I love those authors, John Maxwell and uh, Patrick Lincioni. So my final question is, I mean, let's say that there's somebody listening right now and they're looking at their numbers for the first time. Like they take your advice and they go look at everything mm-hmm. and they're thinking, okay, there's just no way I can do this, or I don't even know where to start on this journey. I don't know um, anything. And so they're feeling a little hopeless, a little clueless. What's some advice that you can give them to get them started and going in the right direction? Well, you and I talked about this before, but I think there's multiple ways to attack debt. And I, you know, there's the debt snowball, the debt avalanche. I'm sure there's a handful that I don't even know about. And people spend so much time evaluating which way to do it. And they get stuck in analysis by paralysis. Just start. I mean, I don't care if you do Dave's plan. I don't care if you do the avalanche. Here's the secret. They will all work if you work. If you stay consistent with whatever plan you're doing, the how, don't get caught up in the how, get crystal clear on your why. And once you do that and you just start to take a step, every step that you take your 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 future your goal gets revealed a little bit more and a little bit more you just have to keep going so i did an iron man last september right and the best piece of advice from the guy that was coaching me through it all you have to do is one forward stroke in the water at a time one bicycle um loop at a time one step at a time and when you do that you'll finish and so my encouragement for people is to just start Love it. Kyle, man, like I said, this has been fantastic. Thank you so much for coming on. I'm sure the people listening have learned just a ton from you and they've enjoyed hearing your story. And so with that, can you share a little bit about what you're doing and where somebody can find you if they want to just follow along on your journey or continue to be inspired by you? Sure. So um, yeah, Instagram, uh, just Kyle Depius, Facebook, Kyle Depius. And my website as well, Kyle Depius, uh, big surprise. Uh, but what I really do now is I, I, I focus with uh, high performers who are successful at work, but they want to be equally successful outside of work. So showing up as a husband that they want to be, showing up as the dad that they want to be, keeping their health and fitness on check. So I help those high performers 
attain success in all categories of life. And I do that through experiences and things like that. So that's one way that that um, I'm kind of focusing in right now and creating a business. But I'm very active on Instagram and on Facebook. And if someone really enjoyed something, I'd, I'd love to have a conversation and, and go further if I can help. Incredible stuff, Kyle. And thanks again. And all of you neighbors, be sure to check out Kyle's website as well as his social media profiles. You can find the links to everything in the show notes, which will be at winning to wealth.com slash episode 12. That's winning to wealth.com slash episode 12. And I hope you had your notebooks out for this one because there was just a lot of free game given out by Kyle. And so the first thing I want to circle back to is how Kyle didn't really project any insecurities onto his family and friends when they were publicly posting the visuals that helped them get out of debt. And I asked Kyle that question because I know a lot of us wonder how our family and how our friends will respond if we publicize the unorthodox things we're doing financially. But just know that oftentimes those are your insecurities and not the reality. So do what's best for your household before worrying about anything else. And I mean, in Kyle's situation, those closest to him were actually inspired, which could be the same for you if you just start to take action today. But if you do find yourself surrounded by some unsupportive people, make sure that you are part of the wealthy neighborhood. The neighborhood is our private community where you can share your wins, your struggles, and even just vent if you need to. And you can find that at winning to wealth.com slash neighbors. Second, Kyle talked about how they realized that in order to be blessed with more, they needed to learn how to handle what they've already been given. And I know there are some instances where this isn't the case. However, I believe that a lot of us are making enough money to live a decent life. But it's our spending habits and comparing ourselves to other people that continue to keep us in last place. So if that's you, ask yourself, how can I handle what I've been given so that when that big bag does come, I'm able to handle it and not have it make me worse off financially because I fumbled it or use it to go get more in debt. Finally, I loved when Kyle talked about how his mindset shifted from asking, can I afford the payments to can I afford the item? Because there's a huge difference there and it doesn't get talked about enough. I mean, as I mentioned, one of those mentalities had me $20,000 in credit card debt, while the other has me buying cars with cash and building wealth today. So don't let your budget be controlled by your monthly payments. Take your control back by getting out of debt and buying what you want with money you actually have. Now, another thing I want to point out is the website that Kyle used to find out his uh, lifetime earnings. I'm going to link to that in the show notes if you'd like to look that up for yourself. Again, you can find that at winningtowealth.com slash episode 12. That's for the link to go back and find your lifetime earnings. So be sure to go to winningtowealth.com slash episode 12. Set yourself up with an account and check that out. It may just be an eye opening experience for you as well. Also, if you found this episode valuable, be sure to share it on social media. That is the best way that you can support the show. And it helps us just reach more people with these money tips and these money stories, which is the overall goal that I had in mind when I started this whole thing. So as always, thanks for listening to The Wealthy Neighbor Show. We'll talk soon.